Welcome, this is Pietro from the Limited Edition and we are live for another episode of The Independence. The Independence is this uh, small format where we explore every week pretty much a newcomer or an established watchmaker from the world of independent watchmaking, recognizing fully that watchmaking is our hobby and what keeps us busy and keeps us together in so many ways. Today is no exception with my co-host uh, Johnny McElleron, our editor, the editor of the Limited Edition. We will introduce you one of those uh, watchmakers that is well in the head of quite a few collectors around the world, the most astute collectors, but still doesn't get, in my opinion, the visibility that it probably deserves. And today we're going to make our contribution to try to get in that direction. So welcome, Johnny. Welcome again. I'm uh, back from Geneva and it's good to see family again. Johnny is always there. Uh, like a good member of the family and uh, always uh, ensuring his support and ready he comes for uh, hosting a watchmaker, Johnny, that is really fascinating uh, for us all. Absolutely. Firstly, Pietro, welcome back from Geneva, from the GPHG. Uh, you're, now that you're famous, I feel that I am in exalted company now. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, uh, I'll finally, and finally, you know why you're doing this with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was fantastic yes. to see on the, uh, you know, the, on mainstream, all the mainstream watch platforms were carrying the GPHG, as did the limited edition, and uh, we had great fun conversing with a lot of the uh, people who had joined us, and uh, so it was fantastic to uh, to see you on the big screen there, Pietro, and you were hanging about with watchmaking royalty no less last week you were i wasn't it. lucky i wasn't lucky enough uh i mean I, I i consider myself really lucky for being part of the event and soon we'll do a video with johnny where we're going to explain absolutely everything Excellent. how the vote yeah. the voting works uh you know the pros the cons the doubts and all of that will answer to everything i would have loved to hand over uh, the price uh, that obviously in 2021, the brand and the watchmaker we're going to introduce now had the ability to get uh, the astronomical price, which uh, by all means is one of the most uh, uh, desired uh, prices because it talks about complication. It talks about interpretation of watchmaking, uh, studying, understanding, researching the stars, which is how watchmaking actually came uh, came about uh, back in the days, centuries ago. So with no further ado, I would introduce our uh, guest today, Pim Kerslag from uh, uh, Van der Klauw, from Christian Van der Klauw. Uh, in a moment of great changes for them, welcome Pim for making the time to be with us today. Very happy to be there. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi, Pim. Hey. So the the uh, the loop on your neck uh, gives away the fact right. that uh, now known as an entrepreneur and a, and a, and obviously a, a, a director of uh, you know uh, small and big manufacturers in your in your curriculum, you are first and foremost a watchmaker. You, that's how you started. You, you nearly ended up working for some of the a big. Uh, uh, the big watchmakers out there as a watchmaker, but then uh, uh, life took a spin and uh, here you come actually, I wouldn't say resurrecting, but actually contributing one of the strong names of independent watchmaking to have a life and to, to continuing uh, having a life. Tell us about yourself, uh, Pim, in a nutshell. Yes, um, yeah, born in Holland and uh, I did the watchmaking school in Amsterdam. Uh, after watchmaking school or some kind during watchmaking school, I did some internships at uh, Kronefeld, you know, the brothers, Bart and Tim. Then uh, I was like uh, elected to be uh, the best watchmaker from the watchmaking school. And the prize was a training at Patek Philippe in Geneva. So uh, I did that. And um, when I was in Geneva, I got to... Um, got to know the founder of Freddy Constant, uh, Peter Stas, also a Dutchman. And we uh, got to talk a little bit and finally uh, he asked me to join the company. And so I had this very difficult choice to either work for Patek Philippe in Geneva or Freddy Constant. And uh, finally, uh, a lot of people uh, thought I was crazy uh, choosing Freddy Constant uh, at the time, were only like ten people working for the company, so it was it was a tiny, tiny company. Uh, but 
the reason that I uh, chose Frey Constant was that um, there I could really explore uh, the creation of timepieces and not only retouching or producing uh, assembly uh, or after sale service, but really creating something uh, myself. And uh, you've you've been piv pivotal in 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 a very important mo moment of Frederick Constant when Frederick Constant actually moved on to be a manufacturer rather than just a you know obviously a, a how can I say a, 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 a standard. Let's pass me this word watchmaker that was using existing calibers to then you know propose different design uh, as a language uh, initially so uh, under your guidance really Freddy Constant moved moved on to uh, to being a fully fledged uh, watchmaker with i think something like 30 calibers uh, developed in at that time yeah at the end uh, well I, I stayed for 20 years huh? so uh, uh, as a watchmaker in the beginning uh, but already with the great vision of uh, Peter Stas, uh, the, the founder and CEO at the time, uh, to be a manufacturer. And we started very small, making a very simple watch with a heartbeat at six o'clock, you know, the open balance wheel, uh, hand wound manual, two hands, relatively um, uh, and, uh, not so complex, but from there, uh, we took every year, we did something different. Started with a moon phase, automatic, things like that. But at the end, uh, we, we created tourbillon, perpetual calendars, um, chronographs, which are very hard to make. Um, and um, even for uh, Atelier de Monaco, which uh, we founded uh, after uh, the brand, uh, which is more high end. Uh, which I became CEO after as well. Uh, we made minute repeaters, uh, really crazy um, self-setting perpetual calendars, that kind of stuff. So it was um, um, 20 years of my life where uh, not only me as a, as a professional uh, group, but uh, also the company and the people around me, uh, when I left Freddy Constant, we had like over 200 people. And uh, when it was bought by Citizen Group in 2016. And um, yeah, so uh, from a family owned company of 10 people, we grew to a multinational like 3.5 billion turnover. <laughs> so it was oh. quite, a, quite an adventure, I have to say. That's quite absolutely. amazing. Eh? Johnny was going to say from uh, from um, how can I say a fully fledged entrepreneurial adventure, you know, starting as a watchmaker, but then obviously turn as an entrepreneurial adventure with Freddy Constant uh, in the in the lower end uh, of watch manufacturing, lower end, but uh, focus on the value for money really, where the orological pro proposition has, has become more and more quality with the time. Then you expressed yourself as a watchmaker, Atelier de Monaco as well, playing with complications that were in, in the classic uh, uh, meaning of the term. And now Johnny taking over one of the heaviest names in uh, in watchmaking. If we're talking about, uh, you know, the AHCI legacy and the role of uh, Christian Wadley Klaw as a watchmaker and as a perpetuator of that uh, um, of that tradition of astronomical watchmaking that dates back years and years, if not centuries, uh, from from now. Uh, how interesting of a challenge! For me, I think it's yeah. uh, a, a brand uh, that I have been familiar with for many, many years. Again, one of those brands that made whenever you first saw one of their creations, and I'm going back for for, for me, 15, 16 years. Uh, and realizing that there's so much more out there than the mainstream uh, creations that we're, we see all the time. And uh, uh, again, part of my great awakening was discovering uh, Christian van der Klau and uh, understanding, uh, just recognizing that we're seeing something that you have a completely unique uh, identity, both aesthetically and technically. And that uh, these were... Uh, watches that were, as I said a moment ago, they were unlike anything else. And uh, so, and uh, and it, it, it's it's the, the Christian van der Klau, the watchmaker himself and his company can be considered to be part of one of the pioneers of contemporary 
independent watchmaking because the brand, if I'm not wrong, uh, PIM is celebrating its 50th anniversary in 2024, yeah? Yes, correct. 50 years already. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, and, because uh, Christian started in 1974 with production of clocks mainly at the time. Yes, true. Yeah, at the time he made uh, wall clocks, um, but always with um, with astronomical complications. He um, uh, he was at the Star Guide, and and uh, so he had a passion uh, for um, uh, for astronomy. Uh, but he was an instrument maker, could make a little bit like everything with his with his bare hands, and um, so uh, yeah. Uh, a turning lath was uh, was enough for him uh, to make beautiful clocks, and uh, that's what he started to do in uh, in 1974 until uh, 1996 when he made his first wristwatch, and actually making all components smaller and uh, to be able to put it in a in a wristwatch. Yeah. So just to point out for those that are. Uh, just uh, tuning in right now. We are live with the Independents uh, with Pim Kerslack from Christian van der Klauw. It's the first time we host uh, a Christian van der Klauw story. So we're digging lit a little bit in the history and in the roots of this uh, brand watchmaker. Um, uh, Pim, the next question is natural. Uh, Christian van der Klauw had a fascination as a, as a Dutch man, as you are as well, with astronomy. Uh, and, and astronomical calculations. Also, he was born and raised in the same town uh, where obviously uh, one of the most uh, important scientific minds of our, you know, of the last a thousand years, probably, uh, Christian Huygens was also born. And, uh, and, uh, and so there is, there is a story that sees a lot of affinities because, be, between what you are doing, what Christian was doing before, and the place where you are based. Yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, Christian um, uh, Huygens and Christian uh, van der Klauw, uh, born in the same uh, city of Leiden. We are now uh, not far from Leiden, but it, it is it is true that it's it is very interesting to see that uh, already at the time of uh, of uh, Christian Huygens, that's three hundred fifty years ago. No. The, the astronomy was so important together with watchmaking. And that's really typically linked to the Dutch culture uh, because uh, we went uh, everywhere to do business. We have a very small uh, country and uh, we knew very quickly that if we want to uh, make it in life, you have to go abroad. So uh, we did business with uh, Indonesia, Japan, uh, the United States, we were like everywhere with the ship. So we had to navigate and to navigate, you need two things. And that's timekeeping. And the second is astronomy. Otherwise you can go somewhere, but you cannot come back. <laughs> so, uh, to, uh, so that's also where and why it was so important for the, in the Dutch culture to have those two things. And uh, Huygens, uh, he invented, of course, the balance wheel, hairspring, uh, patented it, but also he um, uh, perfectioned the, um, uh, the telescope and he was the one that invented or not really invented, but um, uh, he discovered the rings of Saturn. Uh, yes. So, uh, yes, and he invented the pendulum clock as well, which has a lot of yes. uh, obviously significance for then the work of Christian van der Klauw. Uh, yes. Just to say, Christian Huygens is not... Uh, a Dutch specialty in a way because uh, he managed to go far beyond, as you said, the borders of uh, Holland uh, across the centuries. Many of our beloved Johnny uh, independent master watchmakers would would uh, spell out his name when talking about what was the biggest inspiration for their work. Uh, uh, Christian Huygens um, embraced not only astronomy, not only watchmaking, but math mathematics, uh, physics, engineering. Uh, it was really probably the father of uh, what is called the scientific revolution. Uh, that you, have span, to say, uh, yeah. you, you would have yeah, to say. Uh, Very few would argue with that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just one of those profound uh, minds and inventors and 
visionaries. And uh, it's hard to imagine how uh, in such, lit literally in primitive, such primitive times, uh, so many ideas that are still relevant today and not only relevant, but still in use today uh, could have been uh, dreamed up uh, without any electricity or without any uh, precedent or just literally uh, coming out of the blue. It's, uh, yeah. In Just had a collector dinner in Geneva with uh, Bernard Lederer, of course, one of the most important contemporary yeah. watchmakers, focusing his work, especially, like you said, Pim, on escapement and development of escapements. And yeah. he mentioned, obviously, Huygens as uh, one of the pivotal, really, point of references for his work as well, along with George Daniels and, uh, obviously, Abraham Louis Breguet. But coming back to you, um, uh, Pim, so... Taking over the responsibility of, uh, you know, <laughs> no pressure of obviously carrying on this uh, tradition of the Dutch being the best at basically making astronomical clocks, as it's been obviously signed off by the GPHG uh, two years ago uh, as well. What did you think you are bringing the most to the equation? Uh, more the watchmaking side or more the entrepreneurial organization side that you've been tested? really heavily with the strong growth that, for example, Frederick Constant had in the last few years. What was Van der Klaun needing and what is Pim uh, and his team being able to, uh, to provide at the moment? Yeah, I think Christian Van der Klaun was always very strong astronomy and also uh, Daniel Maria did an amazing job putting this brand where it is right now. Um, and uh, with the collaboration with Van Cleef and Arpels, for example, um, we created uh, two beautiful watches for them. And also um, with this planet, with the, the planet, plans. the planetarium, of course, with the planetarium yes. movement. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so that was, I mean, the positioning of the brand, I think, was is, is perfect. I have nothing to add. But the thing that I can add is indeed uh, the, um, uh, the craftsmanship uh, part uh, because we are doing like, I mean, when I came here, uh, I was really astonished. I was really, um, they still have the turning machines and the lathes to create the wheels by hand, teeth by teeth, cutting the wheels and everything. It is really amazing. That we didn't even do in Geneva. In Geneva, of course, was CNC machine and more industrialization. So this, I definitely don't want to change. We need craftsmanship and the Dutch craftsmanship. It's really, I'm really proud of that. So that we want to keep. But organizational wise and uh, commercially, we can uh, really improve. What I like to add to this brand is to make sure that not for the past 50 years, but the next 100 years, we also are still there and be able to uh, maintain and, and protect this craftsmanship and the Dutch astronomy. Uh, that That's really what I want to do. Yeah. Th these are very important uh, values and uh, you already have them in, in place. So it makes great sense to protect and the, the, the integrity of the brand. But if I could move things forward a little bit, because recently uh, all of that hard work was recognized uh, with a very prestigious award, which in two, it, it brings together the, uh, the astronomical side of the, 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 the company and also the, uh, the, the direction that, the, that uh, Christian van der Klauw has has taken on to get recognition for a piece. Because it's time we started showing a few of the images of uh, some of these incredible pieces. So could you tell us a little bit about the what, ha what happened in, the, in 2021? Yeah, no, of course, um, we had this, this beautiful prize, uh, GPHG, uh, first prize in the astronomy. And um, it, it, the watch is called uh, the Ice Eisinga. And here you can see it has a beautiful uh, hand painted 16 layers of oil paint on the dial, wow. uh, which is representing uh, the wooden ceiling of the oldest 
still working planetarium in the world. Here you can see the ceiling and it's wooden planks. Um, and this is, is really a nice story. It is um, Eis Eisinga. Eis is his first name and Eisinga is his last name. Uh, the parents were not very creative, uh, creative obviously. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, this man lived in, uh, in the 17th century or in, in 1774. He created this planetarium because like around him uh, and mainly the church at the time, they were saying that there was a, conjun a conjunction of four planets. And so in the sky, you saw four planets aligned and everybody was saying like, well, this will be the apocalypse end of day because they are too close to each other and they will bump each other and then everything will smash into the sun and that will be the end so everybody was like flipping like crazy and like uh, stressing out but Isa Eisinga was a very smart guy when he was 13 years old he uh, wrote his uh, first uh, book on mathematics so you can imagine 13 wow. and so he thought well it's not true because he knew how it was working you know the planets and everything so they're turning around. So it looks maybe they're aligned, but it's not, I mean, they're very far, far from each other. So he decided to build the planetarium on the ceiling of his own house, his own living room. And it took him seven years to build the ceiling. And it is nowadays, today, still the oldest still working planetarium in the world which is uh, since a couple of weeks, uh, it has um, the recognition of uh, the UNESCO World Heritage. So very proud of this as well. And quite rightly so. So this is what we're actually looking at here, is the, uh, the, the ceiling of the Isa Eisinger uh, Planetarium. Yes, and, yes. Uh, and it's actually a, a function, it is a working model. Yes above the ceiling so really above this what you see the planets are hanging around and above that ceiling you have the wooden wheels uh, with all like pins and everything it's uh, it's working right. perfectly it's working perfectly and that was the inspiration for the gphg prize winning the uh, planetarium I, I yes think. exactly we really yeah. see the connection we want here. to mix so of course, uh, representing this this wooden ceiling, uh, oil painted by hand, but we want to mix the oldest planetarium in the world with the smallest mechanical planetarium in the world, which we have in our um, in our Christian van der Klauw planetarium watch. Yeah, which is actually your signature, really movement and uh, and uh, and timepiece, and which. For those that are not familiar, is obviously a solar system, uh, a solar system on your wrist with all the um, planets mechanically connected and able to uh, show their relative position uh, uh, relative to the sun, which is in the middle, as you can notice from uh, uh, if you're looking at six o'clock, uh, going a little bit upwards, you can see that. And uh, obviously, the watch is completely is completed by a full calendar that is uh, displayed at. Uh, at uh, 12 o'clock yeah fantastic johnny yeah that's the view on the planets that are obviously illustrated as um, as they work uh, around the sun as they they would do in nature uh, uh pim would you like to say something about the uh, yeah. accuracy and uh, and how can i see how realistic the planetarium is as compared to obviously what we can observe um in the solar system yes of course um it, it is it's is very nice because uh it is linked to the calendar so if the date changes of course the planets uh, change accordingly and you can see that in the middle we have the sun now uh, of course uh, the gold-plated sun and the planets the six planets in this case are hand painted and you have the closest to the sun is turning the fastest and the more to the outside of the of the sun you can uh, you get um 
the more away from the sun, the slower the planets turn. Sure. So in the middle or next to the sun, you have uh, the planet Mercury, which is turning once in 88 days. Then, of course, you have Venus and Earth. Uh, Earth is turning once a year. Our calendar is based on that. That and, makes sense. And if you go one uh, picture back, uh, if that's possible, you can see that, yeah, here. Uh, I love this one. That, mm. um, we have the, the, the degrees uh, uh, around and also uh, the zodiac signs um, here, which are um, connected, of course, to the position of the Earth. And uh, then... Um, uh, Can you explain me the degrees? Because I am not totally familiar with what I'm supposed to look at when I look at the degrees. Yeah, we have uh, here uh, on the on the right, we have 180 degrees. And then yeah. uh, near uh, Saturn, uh, the outside planet, we have the 300 degrees. And uh, this is um, um, astronomical degrees. It starts at um, 3 o'clock. Uh, which is the astronomical uh, spring, and then it goes counterclockwise. So starts at zero and then goes around to uh, 360 degrees. So I may say it's stupid, the, but te technically able to then show the seasons as well? Yes, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore also the zodiac signs are, are yeah. linked to that as well. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. Really? For example, uh, the, the, the outside planet, uh, the planet Saturn, is um, turning once in 29 and a half years. So, really slow. Really slow. But when you consider how challenging that is technically, because that's, this is all about gears. Yes. And, uh, so, each one of the, the planets that are represented in the planetarium has its own gearing and that must have been, like it's basically an automaton and a calculator yeah. and it's, it, 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 it's it's profound and uh, it's, that's one of the reasons why the planetarium for me has always stood out as being one of those watches that is it, 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 it's on a different level really it's uh yeah it's incredible and, and it's it's maybe yeah. nice to to say a little bit about that in uh in like easy technical terms because we have of course uh, demultiplication because we want to make the gear train turn slower so in this particular watch we start at the hour uh, hand that's the the base movement uh, or it's the slowest part in the base movement uh, which we pick up the gear uh, the gears for for the planetary module from there and then we go and slow it down until the, the date function uh, that's going once around in uh, per month. Yeah, I'll go back. Then that. we slow it down even more until the indication of the months, which is going around once a year. Then we slightly speed it up, uh, going down at six o'clock to Mercury, but then slow it down again when we go to Mars and slow it down even further uh, to the other planets and eventually uh, to Saturn, slow it down to 29 and a half years for one cycle, one orbit. Incredible. And all that is done with gear trains. And like I said before, our watchmakers are making the wheels by hand on the lab and on the phrase machine. One thing. I've and I've seen that in uh, I went in Geneva to visit Cedric Yoner, one of the last ah, yeah. heroes of uh, <laughs> of real you know handmade watchmaking, and he showed me the process to do that, and he was uh, yeah I was blown away. Uh, tell me, uh, Pim, this this um, module, sorry, I should say caliber, the planetarium is patented by Van der Klauw. No, we could not. We could not. Unfortunately, okay. uh, but. Um, but but good uh, luck if you want to uh, exactly. if you want to copy I'll, that. <laughs> I'll challenge everybody that wants to do that. 
<laughs> which is which is why even even a, a maison like Van Cleef came to you, you know, to animate some of their uh, most beautiful uh, timepieces. Um, you didn't stop there, Pim. Uh, of course, I don't know if Johnny agrees, but there's another very iconic piece from the Van der Klauw collection. Is in my eyes, it's definitely the 3D moon that you call the real moon. How real is the real moon? Yeah, the real moon is called the real moon because it has a special, very special feature. You can see it here. Uh, the, um, the 3D moon is, um, is actually a sphere that is turning around, representing the faces of the moon. And uh, this one is very special because it is really based on the knowledge that we have. And uh, it, it's more scientific because this moon is not clicking like one click in 24 hours, which uh, the, the usual, uh, usually a moon phase does. But this moon phase is turning all the time, continuously. And it is calculated, again, with gear trains to make it so precise that it has a deviation of only one day in 11,000 years. So oh, yes. the oh, most yes. precise 3D moon face in the world. Yeah, challenging, you know, Andreas Trellis standards that are obviously unreal, but it's, they're not on a 3D moon. Uh, so just to get this straight, obviously you said it doesn't just click every midnight uh, for the, all the days of the month, like a standard uh, moon phase would, would do. Um, and it's definitely obviously based on a synodic calendar. Uh, but it, it basically always move, always move as it's yeah. all on an inclined rotation. Yes. It's like a sweep second, but then a sweep moon. Of Amazing. course, turning very slowly, but turning all the time. Yeah. So I, I know you you have moved in a in a in a new uh, facility, uh, <clears throat> the atelier in uh, in Arden. Uh, how how has this been instrumental to bring uh, Van der Klauw where you want it to be? And uh, did you need to increase production? Did you find the de demand the demand was much higher than the than what you could uh, you could produce? How how are these dynamics at the moment? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. Here you can see our new uh, workshop or the building where we have the workshop. Uh, the building is from the 1600s, so very beautiful. It looks beautiful. It looks beautiful. Mm. It, it is very nice, very nice. And uh, um, uh, the, the the watchmakers are very happy to uh, uh, that they can work there. Um, and we made a small showroom, a small museum to represent uh, the the 50 years or 49 years of history of uh, Christian van der Klauw. We have uh, some beautiful clocks here. Some some museum pieces as well. And uh, talking production wise, uh, yes, the production increased a little bit, of course, very slowly, but we can um, say more that uh, the, the waiting time uh, increased because um, it is not easy to, uh, to increase production uh, that fast. Um, of course, I have a little bit of experience, um, uh, as we mentioned, uh, going from uh, manufacture and uh, building something and industrializing something. But this is a completely different game, I have to say. Making. Uh, can we can we give some uh, some numbers on where you found the production when you took over and where you ideally would like to take it? You know, with the. The resources you have now and with the amount of uh, handmade work that all of these uh, imply yeah fortunately i was very lucky to be able to uh, hire some uh, some very good watchmakers and um, uh, that's why we were able to take the, uh, the production from uh, uh, in 2021 uh, when i came uh, from 100 pieces more or less until more or less um, uh, 400 next year yeah so which is still uh quite, which is quite still a tiny number it's still very it's small a big number. improvement but a tiny number in uh, in in yeah in, in big terms yes yeah definitely definitely but the 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 reason for that is that before we were mainly uh in europe um but now 
uh, I started to develop commercially uh, in Asia, where um, I have a, a, a lot of um, uh, a lot of good connections and a, a lot of people that I that I know. Um, and we uh, opened um, only the best doors, but uh, already 15 in Asia uh, for the last year or last uh, year and a half. So that goes very quickly. And, and that includes, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. That includes also the uh, obviously more affordable line, the Ariadne, that also uh, based on the Valjou 7750 with uh, your own module for the calendar, uh, yes. which is a way of entry to uh, the Christian van der Klaave horology. So that should be, in my view, probably the, 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 the bulk of the volume of these 400 pieces, or how is it? Um, in <coughs> in sorry, in terms of split between the, the different collections. Yeah, it's 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 around uh, 150 of uh, of the Ariadne, and um, uh, of the rest is masterpieces. But for me, this Ariadne is very very special and very important. Can you explain us why um, the Ariadne is so strategic? Because we know what are the dynamics of the like, let's call it market, but uh, uh, let's call let's talk about collectors collectors are getting introduced to the brand thanks to the ariadne in many cases yes true and that's not necessarily because they can maybe not afford like a masterpiece but it is also a, a way of saying hey look we're there with a very complicated uh, movement very interesting full calendar 24 hours moon phase chronograph hours minutes seconds and for a very, very interesting price, just to get people aware of the brand. And um, uh, yeah. Just how did you manage, that. how did you manage to find the Valjou 7750? <laughs> uh, it's not easy, but um, you know, after uh, more than 20 years in the business, I know my way around, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also here, um, a very beautiful hand guilloche, hand engraved uh, rotor uh, done by um, uh, Benzinger, uh, Jochen Benzinger in Germany. Of course. So, uh, yeah, those two features. One is the rotor and one is uh, the very beautiful uh, multi-layered dial. The dial is made out of uh, 26 components with a very nicely frosted background and uh, uh, laid on rings and assembled. Johnny, we are we are big fans of uh, making watchmaking also, uh, I would say accessible or give a chance, you know, to uh, the new collectors or to those like uh, Pim said, for one reason or another, would start from a, a, con a contained, you know, um, relatively contained budget. Uh, does this piece feel like the, you know, the, the great milestone, you know, to start and enter the Van der Klaue um, world. Again, one of the, uh, uh, the my favorite complications of all time is the, the, the triple date moon phase and uh, combined here with the, the chronograph and uh, it, it's and, and positioned where it is at the, as it, it does not look like an entry level uh watch Pietro it, it has a huge amount of it it's very sophisticated it's very elegant and uh I I, I think it's a watch with as Pim says creating 150 examples a year it's still going to be extremely exclusive and it is but the detail that you can see in it on the, on the van der Klau, uh DNA is uh it's very very evident and the readability right. is very good if you think about you know the fact that this is a full uh, a full calendar and a chronograph i'm i'm thinking uh i'm thinking what else you can find on the market at that price level um incorporating this uh level of uh you know this 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 number of complications plus uh the, at the quality level uh proposed yeah for I me yeah. go ahead you know, it's not easy to find something. Uh, and that's also, you know, uh, 
my goal, and it's always been my goal, is to make beautiful watches, uh, and and like the value proposition is like crazy, and uh, it's definitely a good example. This one. And what is the price point? Just to remind us, because we've been talking about it. Uh, it's nine thousand, um, a little under nine thousand, eight thousand nine hundred fifty. That's including twenty one percent tax. Considering what the competition is, uh, like in that, for for that combination of complications, it's uh, it, it really is uh, exceptional. I think uh, value for money. So just to show Pietro. Yeah, yeah. and at, at the limited edition, of course, we are proud to be official retailers of uh, Christian van der Klaar of timepieces and watchmaking. And you can see uh, on the listing that is live now, the Ariadne is proposing three different dials. Um, anthracite navy blue and silver at six thousand pounds excluding tax and then uh, all the other obviously collections at a higher price point like the orion uh, the planetarium and the real moon of course they propose uh, an enhanced level of uh, handmade uh, and uh, and um, and complication that we've just discussed in terms of the planetarium and in, st in terms of the of the real moon you also make some uh, uh, artistic pieces um, uh, Pim, as you internalize most of the watchmaking processes, you have the liberty and the freedom to uh, uh, to uh, to experiment um, in in small limited editions. Uh, can I ask you, in this case, how and how important is independence in all this process in uh, being able to propose the watchmaking that you want to propose? Yeah, for me, that's uh, that's that's most important because um, I mean. After all, we have a, a beautiful group of people here. Uh, we're now like uh, 12, 12 uh, people, uh, which uh, seven watchmakers, and they are all like uh, craftsmen, cra the, the, the craftsmen and creative people, and we all want to make beautiful pieces of art, and that's exactly what we do. What can we expect for the for the future, uh, Pim? Are there any uh, uh, how can I say any tasty uh, previews that you can give us and to the collectors that are watching this uh, this video? Yeah, I think. Well, I'm not not going to uh, give away too much, but we have uh, something very nice and very very complicated in mind, uh, which is um, uh, something. Um, uh, that will be our anniversary model. So we'll uh, um, present it uh, next year with our 50th anniversary. And the cool thing is that uh, we work together with Daniel Maria uh, and with um, Christian himself. Christian is uh, 80 years old now, but still very bright man. Uh, and so we work together on a on a model uh, that will be really it will be next level from all points of view so i really i really look forward to that and i you're right i, I want to spend the word uh, about daniel and maria i saw daniel at, uh, at the gpag last week i couldn't say hi to him but uh, the work they have done to keep the name van der Klauw alive and still like you say very much in connection with the man himself yeah. Uh, it's been absolutely remarkable. And uh, I remember talking with them about uh, working together at the limited edition. It didn't quite happen before, you know, as a coincidence, you you turned up, uh, Pim, and we're very happy that uh, we can now uh, propose uh, your watchmaking to our, to our numerous collectors. And uh, as Johnny said the 40 minutes would have done would have gone really really quickly and as you can see we have we have already right. spent the best the best part no. of an hour but it was an absolute pleasure pim and i feel like we should um, uh, dig deeper no johnny on uh, on the van der Kraut story i see this as a beginning rather than than an exhaustive kind of uh, 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 information that we've put out there i hope we can share much more in the future for sure. Uh, we haven't even touched on one of my favorites is uh, the real moon tides uh, where living by the sea. It's uh, something that I, I always marvel at the ability for uh, a watch to uh, be able to, uh, to 
illustrate the, the the tides. We haven't even got talking about that yet, but I am really looking. Would you like? To... Would you like to show it quickly before we? Oh uh, we, well, any we, excuse. We, we and, uh, That's I, a I, picture I, taken from uh, Johnny's Johnny's window, as you can. That's as actually you can my house. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not quite, not quite. But this, I thought this would whet your appetite, be after because I know you're a man I who know. loves a bit of surf. Um, I know. Uh, this is. I awesome. wish. I wish I could surf those waves. Uh, sur surf, the, surfing is a big word. That's but, off yeah. the west coast of Ireland. There are the yeah. uh, some <laughs> of the, the most incredible surf anywhere in the world. And um, so, but the tides with the moon phase is just man, what, what, what an absolutely magnificent piece. We will definitely talk about uh, this again uh, in a in a future conversation pim I, I would i would definitely hope next year and uh, just for pietro was saying to echo what he was saying about the the 50th anniversary piece I, I i think it's fantastic to know that it is really it's not just a collaboration with yourself and daniel and maria but also with christian so it's a really a a, a pan generational uh effort so that's going to be uh incredible to see and Judging by what we have already seen coming from Christian van der Klaal, I think uh, I, I wait with bated breath. <laughs> good, thank good, you good. so much. Thank you Thanks so much, lot, gentlemen. Yeah, too, uh, I'm uh, I'm pretty sure we can uh, talk for another hour or two, but. Uh... Thanks, keep everybody. something for next time let's keep yeah, something exactly. for next time exactly and uh, if you have if you're liking this if you like our content let us know if you have any comment you have any uh, question for pim even if you're watching this obviously uh, not live as a recorded episode just let us know and we will pass it over to uh, to pim we are official retailers of christian van der Klaus. so if you have uh, anything you would like to know more about just get in touch so thank you very much gentlemen and i shall see you both very very soon thank you everyone bye bye, bye. thank you